are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we just read, you give meaning to all things. Lord, you are beyond our comprehension. You are eternal. Uh, your, your wisdom we cannot fully grasp. Lord, we, we ask for your help now. Uh, as we are your creatures uh, seeking discernment on how to live in uh, your creation. Lord, we know we're sinful. We know we're broken. We, we know we're prone to idolatry. So we need your help. Uh, we ask for your spirit to meet with us. I know many of us are al- already weary. Uh, as, uh, some of us may, may have stayed up late last night, and it's after lunch now. Uh, we, we ask for your help uh, to focus, God, to, to teach us as your followers. That's in your name I pray. Amen. Um, so my name is John Parrott. Um, I'm at uh, Youth Pastor at Pear Orchard Presbyterian Church that's in Ridgeland, Mississippi. I've been there 11 and a half years. Um, I've done youth ministry prior to that as well. Uh, my wife's name is Ashley. We have four children, Sarah, Samuel, Jillian, and Will. Um, and we just found out we're pregnant with our fifth. Um, and I've already told many people it's a very big surprise. We thought we were done. Uh, we actually had made a lot of jokes um, of just the absurdity of having five children that we couldn't just imagine that. Um, so we just we just found out, uh, Lord willing, August 7th, our fifth child will be here. So uh, y'all can be praying for my wife who's at home with four children right now while she's pregnant. Um, hey guys, just get her when you can. Um, <laughs> Joey made fun of me the first night because I was late, so I figured I could do that. Um, So that's a little bit about our our family. Um, I'm a student at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, working on my my D-men and uh, student and family ministry. I guess I should have said I graduated from RTS in Jackson in 2009. Um, So this elective is entitled uh, Sports and Spirituality. It's a very vague title. I know many of you don't even know uh, exactly what it is you're you're getting yourself into, but Joey forced you to come to this class anyway. Um... (laughs) And also, there, there aren't any notes on the digital notebook if you're looking for that. Um, so, look, as I said, I'm, I'm at SBTS uh, working on my, my demon, and my thesis is looking at the negative effects of sports on adolescent spirituality. Um, and I know that already put me on some of your bad sides, um, so I apologize for that. I know marrying negativity and sports um, in anybody's minds oftentimes can uh, result in some pushback. Um, I understand that. There, there's a professor, Dr. Sheryl Hoffman, his name is, he's a retired uh, professor now, um, but he reflects on, he was a uh, college basketball player at a private Christian university, and uh, he just relays the fact that, that one time he was, he was playing a game and just, he was appalled at the idolatry that he saw, at the lack of just the fruit of the spirit that he saw, and so he just kind of reflected on it in their school newspaper, he wrote about it a little bit, and just got hammered, obviously, by his coach, um, by many of the players, by much of the student body. And so he he just said, you know, people were just shocked, appalled, that he would actually offer up any kind of criticism uh, towards this this area of God's sphere of creation. Um, So I think it is important that you hear me say that that I like sports, um, that I played sports growing up. I played soccer, tennis, basketball, baseball, golf football. Um, I feel funny saying this, but I was a scholarship athlete in in college, and it was junior college, so don't be impressed by that. Um, I was never, I was never a standout athlete, Um, never the fastest, could never jump the highest or anything like that, Uh, but I think it's important that you hear me say that that I enjoy sports and that I played sports growing up. My my wife was a Division I athlete, so I'm telling you all of that just to say this is how I approach this as a former athlete, um, a fan, former player. Um, Sports are are not evil. Y'all tell me, true or false? Money is the root of all evil. False. Okay. What what is it? 
All right. Um, same with sports. Sports are, are not evil. The love of sports, using love in that same context, um, here, idolatry, that, that's what's wrong. So it, sports are, are, are not bad. It's the medium where much of our idolatry is exposed. Um, it's, it's the people that play the sports that make it bad. Um, again, getting on a heart level there. Sports are a good gift from God. I think God is honored through sportsmanship and athleticism. I think we'll have recreation in heaven. So I want you to hear me say sports are, are a good thing. And I want you to hear me say all of that because I only have 45 minutes with you, so this will be weighed more heavily on the negative. Um, so I'm saying all of this up front, that you hear me say that it is good that I've played sports um, because much of our, our talk will be just looking at um, the negative. Uh, somebody asked me as I re- was relaying my, my thesis to them, you know, why not talk about the good in sports? Um, part of the reason is there's so much literature praising sports. Um, there, there's sports Bibles. There's sports devotionals. Um, so, so the literature is out there on the, the good of, of sports. There's actually a Sports and Christianity Congress taking place over in the U.K. this, this summer. I think it's York St. John University. Um, and I was talking to a professor over there just on, on this thesis, and he said, really, there's, there's a huge void in the literature looking at the, the negatives of sports and the spiritual life of adolescents. Um, that in his study, he's been looking at this you know, for, for some time and has read a lot of the resources out there. He said that the, it's just that there is a void there. Um, so again, I, I feel that it's important that you hear all this introduction up front. I think sports are a good thing. I'm approaching this as a, as a former uh, player. Uh, but my thesis statement and, and kind of claim that you continue to hone the more you read and the more, more you write, the, the current kind of thesis statement that I have is the current cultural climate of adolescent sports negatively affects their spirituality. So the current cultural climate of adolescent sports negatively affects their spirituality. Because remember, we are the problem, so this current cultural climate is controlled by us. So as I go through and and talk and speak on the negativity of sports, know that I'm ultimately referring to the human heart. Um, but one example of what, what I mean by this, the current cultural climate, I know when I played sports growing up, it didn't dominate my life to the degree that it's dominating our current students' lives. Um, we had a, every year in August, we do kind of a, a game night with our students. Again, another reason why I'm not opposed to sports, we, we even implement those in our, our ministry. We, we have a game night kind of ending the summer, about to start the school year. And one of our student leaders came up to me after it was over. He's a great guy. He came up to me and just said, hey, thank you so much for putting this night on. It was great. We had a lot of fun. Again, this is August. He said, I'll see you in November. Because um, football season was about to start. Um, so he was basically just telling me he's not going to see me again for, for the next several months, that he's getting back in, into football. Um, years ago, as I was just getting into student ministry, uh, we used to – Several youth pastors used to meet together once a month from most, most of the PCA uh, churches in the, in the area. Um, and, and one time our conversation just started lamenting that, that we couldn't minister to students um, anymore, that they were just too busy, that we, it was difficult to get with them, that any time they signed up for a retreat they would drop out because they had a sports camp in the summer, and we were just all lamenting this, this fact. Um, so as I entered SBTS and, and started thinking about thesis, I, I knew this is what I wanted to write on. I knew I wanted to, to spend time thinking about this a little bit more. I was, I was tired of just kind of lamenting this fact and not really taking any action. Um, so I know I wanted to spend uh, just a portion of my life um, reading, writing on this, this subject, trying to discern how we can best be discipling our students, discipling our families, on, on engaging sports properly. Um, but not letting them dominate our lives. So look, some of the goals for this elective, um, you know, what's the point of you being here and listening to me gripe for 40 minutes or so? Um, three, three goals that I hope um, to accomplish. First is to try and persuade you that there is a problem. Some of you don't need any persuasion on that. I know as I've already said some of these things, I'm seeing some nodding heads out there. However, some of you might need um, some persuading uh, because of your, your love for sports. It might be hard to see some of these problems or hard to, to swallow this pill, if you will. Um, second is to impart a worldview uh, to each of you. Albert Walters in his book, uh, Creation Regained, he says that a worldview is the most basic aspect to humanity. Uh, it's like 
eating or, or breathing. We simply have a worldview. So each of you here have a worldview about sports. Every one of you thinks a certain way about sports now. Um, so I hope to foster some discernment in, in that worldview, whatever it is. And then finally, it's uh, to begin a conversation. One of the sincere heavenly blessings of youth leader training are, are the conversations we get to have as as youth workers, full-time, part-time, volunteer youth workers going through the same area of ministry. And so I hope this discussion continues as you leave this class, um, as you have coffee together, as you share meals together, and at times in the cabin. I hope this fosters further conversation, but also taking this conversation back home, uh, talking to your students about this, maybe challenging them a little bit, maybe some parents as well having conversations with them, obviously, you've got to be very discerning and cautious about even bringing this up. I mean, I can tell you, I'm very intimidated to talk to you all about this. I have no idea what all of you think about this. Um, so going back home and, and talking to families about this can, can be a, a challenging thing. But um, I know, too, as, as I think about this, this, this third goal and having conversations with students, I had a, had a student come into my office one time, and just he was very discouraged over the fact that he had no time to be in the Word at all. Um, that he wasn't in the Word, that he wasn't praying, and he was just in my office lamenting this to me. And so I just looked at his day, and we kind of broke it down by hours of um, time you need to sleep, time you need to be in class, and you had this extracurricular activity going on, and this as well. You just you don't have time to do it. Um, so maybe it's good to, to cut out one of those. I was able to, to challenge him and, and to see that, Lord willing, this man will grow up to be a husband, hopefully, one day, and have a family. And so imparting that worldview to him that could, you know, in the end, end up, uh, you know, helping him lead a family and make um, better decisions. Um, so I want to frame this talk under two main theological headings. The first is worship, and the second is stewardship. I won't spend as much time on worship because I think that's typically the conversations that we have about sports, and we think about that a bit more um, uh, so, so first, uh, worship. Um, most of us know that we were created in the image of God, and because of this being created in the image of this all-powerful God, we're created to be worshipers. Um, Paul David Tripp says the uh, four most significant words in all of human history is, in the beginning, God. That, that gives shape to all of creation. It gives everything its, its purpose and meaning. However, because of the fall, uh, we know that our worship is redirected to everything other than God. Uh, we worship relationships, sex, smartphones, food, comfort, joy, possessions, money, and sports. Um, we, we know that this is referred to as idolatry. Um, Tim Keller says, you know, oftentimes what we make good things are idols. I just read that it's something bad. And he says the greater the good, the more likely we are to expect that it can satisfy our deepest needs and hopes. So the greater the good something is, the, the more of a chance we, we have to turn it into an idol because it, it looks like it can give us fulfillment and meaning. Um, so three main ways to expose our idolatry. And again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these. We're going to focus on stewardship a bit more, but we know time. You know, time is a, is a big indicator of our idols. Um, sports take up so much time and the, time in the lives of our, our students and families. Some of our students are arriving at school before school hours um, to work out and then going to school and then staying late after school. Um, other than academics, our students are spending more hours involved in, in sports. Um, most of us, I think, we, we would know that when we're planning a, a youth function, we know we've got to look at the calendars, right? We've got to see when, when the home games are and and we know that the church calendar typically um, is ruled out, uh, you know, as it's, uh, you know, in comparison to the sports calendar. Um, money is another way that our idols are uh, revealed. And you think of all the fees on the, on the to be on the team, the equipment, the travel, the gas, the hotel, the private practices, the, the sports camps, the meals on the road. And could you imagine that same amount of money being funneled into the church and the ministry that could be accomplished um, with that. Um, and then lastly, a third way to, to reveal our idols are anger. You know, anger often reveals our idols. I mean, just think about talking about sports rivalries, for an example, and how that can get very heated. Um, we, we know false gods can't defend themselves, so we've got to defend them. And so that's often manifested in our, in our anger. 
Um, so when you bring up the negatives of sports, that the anger that's manifested among parents and teens is often a result of idolatry. Um, now, without a doubt, bringing that up and, and some of the anger that comes out can come from a sense of guilt from the parents. Of you're, you're attacking their parenting in a sense. And again, that can be rooted in idolatry. Um, Chad Gibbs. Has anybody read anything by Chad Gibbs? God in Football or Love Thy Rival? Those books are here, and they're, they're hilarious at the same time convicting. Um, so if you can pick any of those up, it, they're, they're very good. But he, he said as he was writing Love Thy Rival, um, and it looks at some of the sport's greatest rivalries, he said somebody emailed him about a Sunday school class that waged electronic war on Facebook over the Iron Bowl one year, and it got extremely heated. And at the end of this Sunday school class, the, the teacher was sincerely begging for God to restore unity, that, it, that there had been... You know, so much heated debate online. Um, so again, our, our our idols can manifest anger in our hearts. And Tim Keller once again says, an idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, most of your emotional and financial resources on it without a second thought. Um, so look, that that's just briefly uh, some some on stewardship. Now, I'm, so, I'm sorry, some on worship. Now switching to stewardship. Um, we know after God has created us in His image, uh, He then gives mankind dominion over all created things. We refer to this often as the creation mandate to be fruitful, multiply, to fill the earth, and to subdue it. Um, God is Lord and King over all things, and we are His stewards. He places us in creation to steward it. Uh, Burke Parsons says there's no such thing as a bad steward. A bad steward is oxymoronic. That a bad steward is simply no steward at all. So, so we are imperfect stewards, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're to strive to steward this creation that, that God has, has placed us in. So uh, for those of us as parents and then those of us um, ministering to parents and, and youth, we, we are to steward the youth that God has placed under our care. So as we think of this idea, this, this heading of stewardship, again, looking at some of these categories we already looked at, look at, look at money again. Um, there's a book entitled The Most Expensive Game in Town looking at, at youth sports. Um, and it says many parents will quickly say that all their involvement in sports is really just to um, get a scholarship in the end, to provide in the end you know, for college. But, but again, looking at all the, the, the fees and the travel and the hotels and the gas and everything else, the stats have showed that they could have paid for college two to three times over if they would have forfeited all of that. Um, there's a professor I was able to sit down with at, um, at SBTS, and he has um, extremely athletic children. One of his uh, sons is one of the, the highest recruited, I think, potential baseball um, players in, in the state of Kentucky. Um, but I was asking him about this idolatry. We were having a conversation, and he just said, <laughs> so do you struggle with this or you know, str- struggle with um, something? He said, no, it all changed in 2010. Said, you know, what happened then? And he said, they just made a decision as a family. He was off with one of his sons somewhere. It had been, I think, 10 days of travel. They had been on, on the road. His wife was somewhere else. The other son was playing somewhere. And they were just thinking of all the money they were spending. And he was just very convicted. Um, and so he said they ended up meeting as a family. They took a year off from sports. Um, and he said he was prepared for just World War III in the home. The children thanked him. He said, thank you. For this break, he, he said he prepared himself as he went up to the coach um, of one of his son's teams, and the coach said, "That sounds amazing. I wish I could do that. I wish I could, I could take a break." Um, so it was this conviction over the amount of money that that drove d- drove him to make you know this um, decision in their family. Um, our bodies are something else we are to steward. Um, now. This is something that I, I continue to wrestle with, and I don't have the answer on there. There's so much gray in this, but that's one of the helpful aspects to again, doing this, having these, these um, times to discuss some of these issues. But is it wrong for our children to play in sports that encourage violence? And I know we want to dismiss that quickly, and, and, but, but it's something we, we need to re- reflect on. It's something we need to think about since our bodies don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord, and we are to steward them and, and care for them. And I know sports assist in a lot of that. Um, without a doubt, they are helping us steward the, our bodies. But we've got, we, we've got to think about just some of the violence that, that's involved in some of these sports. I, I'm not here to debate this at all, but I think MMA fighting is sinful. Um, I think that's 
I think most of us would agree on that, but some of us might not. Um, I just read a New York Times article last week of this um, MMA fighter who's now brain dead um, because of uh, one fight that he was in. Um, so I think we can say in a, that sport, that's a, objective, is to ultimately beat that person into submission to where you, you win. Boxing is, is somewhat similar. But then when it gets into football, we know the objective of football is not to injure another player. It's to get into the end zone. However, we know that some of these players act sinfully and inflict injury upon other players. Um, but it's something we do need to reflect on and think about um, as we wrestle with this because we know many of our parents are very concerned, and rightly so, with, with violence in television shows and, and movies. Um, but what about real violence that's taking place to our, our children? I don't know the answers to all that. Um, that's, that's very challenging, I think, um, but it's something for us to think about and consider. Um, most of the youth that are playing baseball, it's been studied and discovered that they're pitching more uh, than professional pitchers. Uh, they, they have put greater restrictions on some of these players, but what they don't factor in are their warm-up pitches. And so it's been shown that um, I think it was yeah, 92 pitches that this professional player had pitched and a Little League World Series player had pitched 93 times. Um, and then another one was 116 times. Um, John Smoltz, uh, this summer, I don't know if any of y'all saw that. It was this summer, right? I'm not a baseball person as he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Hammered parents and coaches um, for, for these young arms, he kept saying, of just how they continue to throw these balls. And every you know, ball that they're throwing is always a competitive pitch. He said, you know, let them be children and just play in the backyard and not have to sling it as hard as they possibly sling it because these arms are not created to be throwing the ball you know, this hard. And so some of that is the early sports specialization that has taken place, and people are debating uh, the benefits of that because typically the early sports specialization results in either burnout or injury to these children because they're starting so young. And, and mu much of this can be traced back to October 6, 1978. There was a, an evening show kind of like Jimmy Fallon, and this little, it was either two-year-old, three-year-old, swinging a golf club, hitting golf balls. Everybody thought it was cute, and it was Tiger Woods, obviously. And so after all these parents saw, hey, this little child can do this, that would be amazing. Let's, let's start them young. Let's get them specialized, and you can raise a professional. Um, so we've got to think about, again, stewarding uh, these, these children's bodies. Um, there was a study that showed, uh, I think, the sport that had the most injury is cheerleading. Um, which is interesting, more, more than, than other sports that cheerleaders uh, sustain uh, more injuries than, than any other sports. There's a documentary called Head Games. Um, uh, is it Cindy, Sydney Parlow or Cindy Parlow? Do you know who's on the World Cup soccer team? Two years, anybody? Sydney. Yeah. Okay. She's sort of this thing called safe soccer um, where she's trying to – to start to where 16 and older um, can head the ball, but any below the age of 16 cannot head the ball in soccer because of the concussions that are occurring in soccer. She says that she now drives down the road with a GPS constantly because as she's driving, she forgets where she is. Um, and she'll have to look at her GPS. She, she doesn't even know where she's going anymore because of all the concussions that she's had. And so she's making this big push to start safe soccer. Um, but in that documentary in Head Games, there's a neurologist as well that just talks about the absurdity of peewee football. Um, that just the body structure of these kids and how weak their necks are, their heads are huge, and so they're just running into each other, and there's so much damage. Um, he just went on and on talking about the dangers of that. We know the concussion movie that just came out with Will Smith. I haven't gotten to see it. I don't know if anybody else has. Um, I know Sony, uh, I think the NFL you know, met up with Sony and, and try to put some certain restrictions on, I think, some various scenes because they were afraid of some of the pushback they were going to get from this. Um, but that documentary, Head, Head Games, is something very important I think y'all should, should look at. And obviously the, the physical concerns are serious, but even as um, Richie was talking earlier, the connection between our bodies and our souls as well, um, that we know that, that that is the primary concern for us. Um, William P. Farley and... and uh, the book Gospel Powered Parenting, he says that most Christian parents assume their child's salvation. He says this could be their biggest parenting mistake. Um, so I think that that's 
that might be part of the reason that uh, there's so much involvement uh, in teen sports that the parents feel like they've checked off their, their Christian walk, that their kids are good, and so now we can spend more time you know, possibly in sports. Uh, in the book Almost Christian, it says American young people are unwittingly being formed into an imposter faith that poses as Christianity, but that in fact lacks the holy desire and missional clarity necessary for Christian discipleship. Um, Chap Clark in his, in his book, Hurt, which many of you I'm sure have read. He talks about the danger of getting students so involved in youth sports and that becomes their identity. And we know that all of our students wrestle with that. We all struggle with finding our identity in something other than Christ. But he relays a story of this girl who, who says, she says, I always played sports until I blew out my ankle and had reconstructive surgery. At that point, I went from JV volleyball, varsity basketball, and varsity softball to the girl with the blown ankle. The remainder of my high school career, I played only volleyball when I could fit my foot into my shoe, so everything I once identified myself with was gone. I slipped into depression. I started doing drugs and skipping school. Um, So again, that's an extreme example, but another danger of our our students' souls being so tied up and so connected um, with with, um, sports and, and again, not being discipled in the church because there's no time for them. And so... That's the last thing I want us to look at as we, we talk about stewardship is, is the factor of time, that we know that all of our time belongs to the Lord, that, that Christ purchased our time. Um, thanks to the gospel, Jesus Christ has redeemed all of our time, every second that we waste um, and on frivolous things, He has redeemed that. Um, still, we are to strive again by the Spirit um, to use the time the Lord has given us um, in His service. Um, so, I've had I've had many conversations with parents, parents my age and parents older, kind of lamenting the fact that they're they're so busy um, with, with all of the sports activity. You know, they're they're lamenting the fact that they're separated as a family, that they never have time at home, that they never have time to sit down and have a meal together. And so my I'm somewhat baffled by that because they act like they don't have a decision um, in, in the matter. And so my question is just, you know, why, if you are so stressed and if you, if you really want to get together as a family, why, you know, why aren't you making efforts to, to, to be together? And so here's six possible reasons for that. Um, the first is, is fear. Um, fear is, is hardwired into our DNA. We are created to fear God, but our sin redirects our fear into so many other things. And so what is the fear here that that's motivating um, the the busy schedules is the fear of missing out. Um, the fear of missing out. My child might miss out and be excluded. All of their friends are doing this activity. All of their friends are on this team. Um, and so my child's going to miss out if they're not a, a part of this. And we can understand that. We can sympathize with that. Um, as I was doing some thesis work, I was able to sit down with Ligon Duncan and kind of pick his brain about some of this. And it's interesting to me because... You know, he's a chancellor of RTS, but he was a senior pastor for 18 to 20 years. He stressed this point more than any other. He kept going back to this fear aspect of this is what's you know, driving these, these crazy schedules. Um, or, or another fear, a fear of missing out on their calling. You know, If we don't involve our child in multiple sports, we're not going to figure out what they're best at, and they might miss out on their calling. Um, another fear is the fear of getting into trouble. If we keep our kids busy, they'll stay out of trouble. If we keep our kids busy, they won't do drugs. They won't fornicate. They, they won't um, drink alcohol. But I can say from experience that I learned a lot about drugs from soccer. Um, that I, I learned a lot about you know, all kinds of evils. Not to mention um, much of my idolatry was fed through my athletics. Um, a second reason while... Parents might be uh, so busy. Um, it's child-centeredness. Child-centeredness. A child-centered home. We know that our, our culture is obsessed with youthfulness. Some of the loudest and most influential voices in our culture are barely 20. When you think of Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, Bieber Adele. I'm thinking of the athletes that make millions and millions of dollars. Most of them aren't even 30. Um, on Saturdays, we, we get to walk together to watch college football to show on a bunch of 18 to 23-year-olds. So we're, we're obsessed with, with youthfulness. Um, and so many of the homes are, are focused on the children, are, are child-centered. And children are, are quick to figure this out, and they're quick to realize, hey, everything revolves around me. Um, I remember 
I was hanging out with a student one time, and uh, the parents came home with their, their daughter from soccer practice, and the girl just plopped down on the couch and held up her foot and said, untie my shoe to her mom. Not please, um, just put her foot up, and the mom got down on her knees and untied her shoe. Um, so it seemed like that this family was very focused on this child and her success and serving her uh, to do that. So children are often driving the calendars and the schedules, and this is just one way we, we see this, um, idolatry. Uh, a third reason for the busyness is conformity. I think many parents enter into th- this busy lifestyle because that's simply what everyone else is doing. Um, they haven't really given much thought to it other than, you know, everybody's doing this at this age of life, and this is kind of what you do, and so they just get involved in it. Um, but we know that a lot of the, the school systems are also um, function this way to, to stress the importance of uh, sports act- activities. Um, a fourth reason for the busyness is the second chance. Um, in one of Walt Mueller's uh, recent articles, he asked the question, who's out on the field? And then he goes on to say, unfortunately, some parents see their kids as a second chance to fulfill the dreams that they never were able to fulfill out on the field. Um, so it seems that the um, harried lifestyles of many of our families are answered by the questions, what, what if? Um, I think many of us have seen those parents that are living vicariously through their children. Uh, there's a great sense of pride, obviously, in the, the parents seeing their child being successful in sports. Just recently, my two oldest children were able to run in a, in a fun run just for an adoption, and we've never trained or done anything like that, and they did really well. And I was proud as a father that they did this, so I could see how, how appealing this would be, how, how, how fun that would be to, to share in that. And so sometimes it's simply... You know, enjoying the gifts that the Lord's bestowed upon your children, uh, but there's also this caution of of living vicariously through your children, kind of pushing them towards excellence, and that being our motivation. Uh, the fifth reason is identity. Um, again, I think this feeds the the busy schedules because if we aren't busy, we aren't valuable. We feel like um, it's impressive to act like we're busy, to talk like we're busy, to let everybody know that we're busy, and we know that Scripture. Um, speaks negatively to laziness and to the sluggard, but busyness isn't um, the, the solution to to laziness. Um, but slowing down does sound counterproductive to much of our culture. Even the way that we use the word, if we talk about somebody who's not very smart, we say that they're slow. So there's negative connotations attached to that word. Um, and that leads into the sixth and final reason for some of these busy schedules um, is conflict. Uh, One of the main reasons that God tells us to rest is so we have time and silence and solitude to reflect on His goodness and His provision. But here's the challenge. When we slow down, we can actually hear the inner turmoil in our hearts. When we slow down and we get into solitude and reflection, we're reminded of our sinfulness, of our brokenness. So I think many are busy because they don't want to hear that. They don't want to think about that. Um, But not only that, Conflict in the home. You know, Bobby and Sally hate each other in the home, but if we split them up, we put Bobby at this in this sport and Sally over here, they don't have to deal with each other. And as parents, it's much easier to, to not have to, to deal with that, just to get them in, in different sports. And then, sadly, we know that this goes for husbands and wives as well. Um, there are husbands and wives that are miserable in their marriage, but they know if they just split up and they don't have to be together in the home, they can tolerate each other. Uh, for a time. So I know that that is a, a reason that um, uh, lends itself to, to these busy schedules. Um, so I think most of us would agree that our culture is very busy. It's safe to say that. Um, so much so, I know many of us see that uh, many other extracurricular activities are taking priority over Lord's Day worship. Um, I know many of you see empty seats in the sanctuary in your church. Um, Oftentimes, if we try to combat that at all, we're labeled as legalistic and judgmental. Um, You know, you'll you'll challenge a student and they'll say, but, you know, we've committed to this team. We've made this commitment. And they talk about commitment. What about their commitment to Jesus Christ? What about the vows that they took when they joined the church? And, again, it's hard to have those conversations with parents and students. And it's hard to to enter into those discussions without coming across as judgmental. I know we have many families that say, you know, we're just... So busy, we needed some family time. 
you know, so we just skipped church on Sunday. We've just, we've been going here and there, and we just, we didn't need a time as, as a family. Um, but they'll rarely tell the coach that, right? Um, they'll rarely say, coach, we're just not going to be at the game. We need some family time. Um, we're not going to be at practice because we need some family time. But they'll skip the Lord's Day worship, and that is obviously extremely serious. Um, so just drawing this to a close, because I know we're running out of time and maybe have some time to discuss some things. Um, just five suggestions as we close. The first is God's grace. Uh, we sinned against God. God doesn't owe us anything, yet He gives us fun and entertaining things like sports. We need to say that, that God's grace is bestowed through this. You know, as we watch them, as, as we play them, but see them as a grace, as something extra, not something we deserve or something to attach too much happiness or identity to. Second thing is our responsibility. We know that ministering to youth and families calls us to do hard things. We must rebuke fellow sinners when we know that they're living in sin. In my years, I've had some exceedingly difficult conversations with students. And I'm not saying that a student who's highly involved in sports is necessarily in sin, but there may be a conversation that needs to take place. Um, and a third reason uh, is the student's soul. You know, we, we must be thinking about the student's soul that we're ministering to. I don't know about you, but, but I shudder to think of the, the ways in which I've shirked my responsibility over the years as a youth worker to not have difficult conversations with students. If it's a student I really want to like me, I might just avoid having a difficult conversation. But I think having this eternal perspective on their soul um, can, can motivate us properly in, in these discussions that we need to have with our students. And the fourth reason is wisdom. Um, God promises to give us wisdom if we ask for it, and we definitely need wisdom in this area. Um, as I've said, and you've heard me through this talk, that I don't know all the answers. There are a lot of questions to this. There's a lot of gray area. And so we need the Lord's help. We need His wisdom um, in having these conversations with our students. And the fifth is the gospel. Church attendance, service to the church, involvement in the church, Bible study shouldn't feel burdensome when we have the proper perspective on the gospel. We think that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life that we could not live, and He died in our place. Then, then why is it burdensome to worship Him on, on His day? Why do our students and parents think they're, they're missing out when they pick church over sports? It's the result of a small view of their Savior and a small view of the gospel. And it's the truth of the gospel we must grasp and we must proclaim as our proper motivation in the discipleship of youth in this area. So look, this was... Hard to summarize, you know, as I said, this is my, my thesis that I'm working on. I, I'm on page 60 right now of 150, and so I tried to whittle this down. Um, but again, it was much, um, I know, more negative, um, as I said earlier. What, what are some questions we might have? I know Krishan speaks in 10 minutes or so. Um, we started a little bit late. Um, comments, thoughts, questions? Yeah, Andy. I'm trying to think about, like, you mentioned MMA and things like that. And trying to think about boys and testosterone and, you know, it's got to go somewhere. I'm not sure about MMA. That could be a whole other discussion. But yeah. Yeah, I know that opened up a can of worms. By the way. I'm sorry? I said I know that opened up a can of worms. About anyway, I'm just thinking, is there, a, is there a legitimate way of saying, can we direct this into a focus? kind of thing rather than it just being a race that kind of goes everywhere. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, physical activity, that, that's a good thing. I think we often just think it's got to be in a competitive sport, that it could just be, and again, this goes back to the busyness, but fathers getting out in the backyard with their sons and you know, wrestling in the living room, doing something to get energy out. Trust me, I've got a six-year-old boy, almost two-year-old boy. They, they need to get outside and they need to get energy out. Um, so yeah, um, it just doesn't always have to be, I, I guess, through um, organized sports. It could be other ways. Is that kind of getting yeah. at what you're? I, I, I like to chat with you. First. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. First of all, you know, I love everything you said. I hate sports. They're <laughs> the worst thing ever. So, it's so like, you're, you're like, this is great. Um, yeah. But I, I have a question about something. It just came to mind when you guys were talking about MMA, and um. Would you say that 
I don't watch MMA, so I'm not trying to defend it. I don't, I don't care a thing about it. But I do know that many boys, we would say it would be great for them to be raised up to be soldiers, which is inherently violent, hmm. and it's something they have to practice, like boxing or MMA or anything else. Maybe could you distinguish, like, I could see someone raising the argument that, like, well, you wouldn't say, you know, it was a sin to be a soldier. Certainly, David was a soldier, among mm-hmm. other things. Like, you know, how would you distinguish between those two things? Or is there a distinguishing thing, or does it even matter? You can just throw it wherever you want. Yeah, let's close in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, yeah, I think, you know, with, with warfare, um, soldier, yeah, I guess self defense and protecting, and um, that's different than, you know, a sport and competition of beating someone up just kind of for fun. Um, and, you know, competition, let me say, I think that can be a good thing. Um, some people have debated on if it's competition result of the fall because, you know, typically you're, you're glorying in yourself and you're putting someone else down. But typically when you enter into sports, you've agreed upon certain rules. And so competition can be viewed as iron sharpening iron, that both opponents are agreeing, okay, we're both going to push each other. So, but, but beating someone's brain out, brains out for a competition I think it's, it's definitely just apples and oranges when you're comparing it to war. But I'm just taking this on the fly, so I could think more I, about I really it. I'd really put you on the spot. No, I, that, I hey, see, that's an excellent question. I'm totally on your side. But I can see someone being <laughs> Back like, off, well, Kurt. how do you get ready for war? you got to train and get somebody. Yeah, no, that's so, a very good know, point. Like, um, yeah. Anyway, it, yeah. But I love everything that you said. <laughs> I'm going to steal so much of it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> stay with this on my own, guys. Let me tell you. First, there's a problem. That's <laughs> yeah, I would like to. Would like to think can I contribute that. to that question? To his question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. To his question. Um, I think there's also a difference between, uh, for instance, MMA and other martial arts, even something like boxing. And that in, in traditional boxing and then Eastern style martial arts, there's an emphasis on control and discipline. That there's there's built into that style of fighting a uh, a personal development and maturity that comes with the physical discipline. That in so I don't know MMA well enough to know, but in at least the atmosphere of MMA is a lot more just violence and aggression, and just we're just finding the coolest way to beat somebody up. Mm-hmm. And isn't MMA the only? There's no eye gouging. And no crotch oh. kicking. Isn't that the only no fish hooks? Fish hooks. Okay. Yeah, real quick. So other than that, I mean, you can. I uh, I dance much like here. Okay, there you go. So and, you got uh, a little something to say about and, that. Uh, and is a uh, a cross training mixed martial artist instructor. And so if anybody wants to talk about this stuff, I'd love to talk about it afterwards. So I well, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's a. Uh, some of it is simple, but. There are, there are way more rules than that. I think just to speak honestly to it. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, good because I don't know a whole lot about it. So you would kind of draw some parallels to the whole football analogy that the objective is not to injure the actual player to get to the end zone. And so in mixed martial arts, they're, isn't it, aren't you trying to inflict enough pain upon somebody so they tap out, like breaking well, uh, bones, things like that? You know, uh, <laughs> so, but, but there's, um, and I'm not saying that, uh, like my goal wouldn't be to convince someone that, that it's, it's right or wrong, but there's there's more uh, there's more to it than than brutality. Yeah. And this is coming from a guy who's had several concussions in his life from <laughs> from jujitsu. You know. Your dad yeah. Hate you. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you. admittedly, without a doubt, my my statements on mixed martial arts are very simplistic because I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, yeah. It just I want to get off. MMA for a second. Yeah, no, I did not know that's what we're focused on that, and that's that's my fault. But (laughs) can can you talk a little bit more about how you have these kind of difficult conversations with students about um, sports on Sunday? I mean, it's one thing to say, it's one thing, like, to, like, you kind of, I mean, it's kind of like a gotcha move that you pulled there. It'd be like, of course, they'll never say those things, to say the pastor to the coach. But our thing is grace. We gotta forgive them. We gotta have them back. So yeah. you know we can't like. But how, so you know, like, I mean, just be honest. I mean, uh, yeah. So could, could you talk a little bit more about that? Can I add on a question, Kurt? Yeah. And speak to in the answer. Uh, that was pretty good. I don't, I don't know. have as much relationship with that kid. If I'm gonna have our conversation, I want as much relationship as I can. 
I have less relation with that kid because he's not around. He's yeah. Not, it's yeah. 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 We, we got two kids going to Olympic yeah. trials, yeah. and they can't yeah. be at Smart because they, they're going to train. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, this is, again, just kind of knee-jerk, but I think in some ways you just you can have those conversations with students that you don't have much of a relationship with. So maybe those that, that you do have more of a relationship with, you do have that time, you can have those more challenging conversations with because you've kind of built up some of that trust and they know that you love them and you care about them. Um, does that kind of get to your part of the, not really? Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering parents. Like, I mean, it's tedious. Like, if you're thinking they're, they're kind of friends spiritually anyways, wife more committed than husband. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a sticky wicket, I guess. But. Yeah, but, I mean, you're, you're bringing up a great question because I think it does, and, I mean, maybe we should be humbled and acknowledge this, that there's just some laziness on our part to, um, you know, disciple those. I mean, are these covenant children you're, you're speaking of that? I mean, we probably... Yes. We, yeah, we, I mean, all of us probably have covenant children that just... This, so. have, and, and so, you know, we do have a responsibility to, to have those hard conversations even if yeah. we don't have much of a relationship with them. Um, I guess kind of, you know, getting it, you know, what you're saying, you know, large group teaching, you know, trying to bring it up in those, those contexts, bringing it up one-on-one, you know, in discipleship. Um, I'm trying to think. I've definitely had some of these conversations with parents. Um, so, yeah, what was your question again? <laughs> Don't worry about it. You're good, man. Okay. I mean, that's obviously, yeah, you're, you're, you're asking for trouble. Um, and you're asking yeah. for enemies, and you're asking, but, but we know but we're going to have to step on toes and, and minister. We, we've got to call people out in our idolatry. They're saying we've got to call them to repentance. So if that's sports, then, I mean, we've got to be calling them out for that. you got to have your senior pastor behind you before you start having yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, you, what you mentioned earlier as you were sharing is really important. There is a time when we have to be the initiator of do you run yourself on the ground? Mr. and Mrs. Smith, your son's twinning out or whatever, but oftentimes, more often it's going to come in the context of you got a student you know is exhausted, they're worn out, they're stressed, they're anxious, they're whatever, and, and you have an opportunity to you know talk to them about that and say, well, let's do like you said, let's look at your life. You know, What are the things that cause you the most stress? What, and in the context of the conversation, you're not attacking them. Or yeah. You're just simply saying, what what do you feel like you could let go of? And it creates, they answer the question themselves. And also, like you said, I want to say, it's awesome. Large group teaching is a great time to be just like powerfully subversive. I'm all about subversive. <laughs> I mean, you teach it on X, and you can work in anything. It's like, you guys are stressed and anxious and worn out out there. I mean, maybe you're on too many soccer teams. I don't know. It's like, plant those seeds. Yeah. Uh, it's, we, a lot of us do that already, but you're doing that very thing he's calling us to do in those moments. Yeah. You're not, not having to be an aggressor, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're definitely... You have to expose the idolatry in our students, and so yeah, it's gonna may yeah, move us to do that. Hey John, on that real quick. Yeah, it may be too that if you begin to establish, if you haven't already, that the periodic pattern of my ministry is to sit down with the parents to have a conversation, and just say, "How do you think your sons do spiritually? Where do you think they are in the Lord?" And the first two or three times, you're just listening to them and you're offering your slant and not hitting the button right off the bat, but then you've got a platform established in the ministry by which you can begin to deal with hard things with mom and dad in regard to the children. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. That did remind me, I guess, kind of getting back to Kurtz, is we do a parent orientation for students coming into the youth ministry for first-time parents, and that's, that is a conversation we bring up to the parents of you know, just kind of the, the busyness of the culture and preparing them for that. And so that does offer some opportunity um, just to get that on their radar, to challenge them a little bit. Um, because you're kind of talking about them the years ahead, so you're not really directly challenging them right now. You're getting them to think about, you know, the next years. So it's a little less awkward, maybe. I know you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was interested, kind of, you didn't really touch on it a whole lot because this is more about students being in sports, but even the way students consume sports, like watching mm-hmm. sports constantly, um, which was a real thing for me growing up. Was, like ESPN was on all the time. Yeah. I watched Sports Center like six times on Saturday, and it was the same show. They didn't do the <laughs> 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 it was the same one. I just watched it to watch the top ten plays. Um, 
Sabbath issues and two points. Yeah. Yeah. Just have a podcast going in the background while you're watching football. Um, so, I mean, going, watching the NFL instead of going to church, is that what you're? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, let's say that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, Joey? You know, Joey. Um, when I, I'm trying to think. You said something yesterday, and it just went out of my mind. But yeah, everything Joey says is wrong. What would be a good yeah. way to start that conversation? It's a sign of no new life. That's um, right. Yeah, that's it. I mean, who was it talking about bo- being bored in sermons? Was that you? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, was showing – no, okay. So, yeah, I mean, if they have absolutely no desire to be in church on Sundays to worship their supposed Savior, I mean, those are, you know, I guess, like you said, a softball – question to be asking these students of you you know and you kind of maybe let them self confront of okay over here you're you're saying you're a christian you say you love jesus but here you're you're missing the one day he's kind of set aside for his worship what can you reconcile that for me you kind of throw it back to them maybe that'd be a softer way to address that is that kind of yeah no that's great all right craig so um i'm thinking more of the parents here what what are some maybe examples you've seen or maybe just through your study of parents kind of handling it in a balanced way where they're not just completely jettisoning sports, but they're taking a step back and having a good balance with their kids. And just to kind of, if you're having conversations with kids or parents and say like, here's, here might be some good steps to take, or here's some things to think about. Yeah. It's kind of a healthy balance. Um, I know some families have just decided one sport. You're going to play one sport and that's it. Um, pick your sport or, again, extracurricular activity. I guess we could throw those in there. Um, uh, guitar playing, piano playing, whatever. Um, so, yeah, just pick your thing, and that's what you're going to stick with. And so I think that's that's a healthy balance. Or even if it is, you know, we, we know typically I think football takes up more time than, than other sports. We're just knowing, okay, look, you're going to play football. It's going to be busy. It's going to be crazy this, this fall after Christmas, nothing else. And we're, we're going to kind of pull back and be together more as a family. So you kind of know for that season of time, it's going to be a little busier, um, but we're, you know, I would say committed to the church and, and other ministries, um, so we're not going to let those conflict, but um, we'll kind of pull back a little bit as the spring comes around. Does that kind of help? All right. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Do you have another question? There's another question. Okay. Um, could, could you speak to how you've approached it with your folks? Um Approaching the issue not so much as like trying to be territorial and, and saying like mm-hmm. I w- you need to quit sports because you need to be at everything that we're mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because that can quick that that's a quick turn off and if so many kids are already over programmed like if if they squeezed in everything that that we did as a youth group on top of what they're already doing like that they're just in worse shape. Yeah. How do you? That's how do you approach that? Very good point. Um, because yeah, the church is just as guilty of creating, you know, a ton of busyness in the lives of families as extracurricular activities. So, I mean, one thing we say often, you know, we seek to be a family-friendly ministry, and so we we cancel a lot of things. We, we pull back on ministry programs and things during busy seasons of life. You know, typically as school's beginning, uh, we don't have anything going on the, the first week of when, when everybody's going back to school. Um, exam time, Christmas season. I mean, we, we, we conclude the first Wednesday of every December because we know Wednesday, I mean, um, the rest of December gets insane. Um, and then as we, the students start back, that we don't have anything that first week and then exams on the other end. And, um, so we, we try to cancel a lot. I, I think I read that several years ago of, of how that, that helps families. And so I guess that's one way. Um, because you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we, we turn our ministries into idols, and, and we 
want them there, not for the Lord, but for us. And so one is, I mean, we definitely need to repent of that. We need to see that and pray against that in our own hearts. But I think the, the cancellations are just one way to kind of help families and students not be so burned out. Yeah, Brad. I mean, I think and maybe out. maybe Brad's question will be the last one because Krishan's, you know. Uh, okay. uh, he yeah. said he didn't mind if he went over on his time. He was good. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to comment on that. I mean, yeah. That's something you said earlier, I think Joey too, but like, how's your kid doing spiritually? How are they developing? Are you seeing them grow? The stuff that we're offering it, it are means by which we're hoping to help them grow. And here's what we're doing. Here's our scope and sequence. Here's what we're going to cover. Here's how relations we see them working. Do your kids have Christian friends? Are they learning to grow spiritually? Are they learning to pray for each other? Are they having opportunities to do that? Like, this is what is this the most important thing that you want developed in your kid? I mean, I've had this question. I, I mean, I did sports in college, and um, with my own son, realizing like what what people are asking of of sports in terms of recreation, like, I don't care if he plays sport in college, like, I don't, if he misses opportunities he would have had, so what? If it cost him his spirituality? Mm. No. Um, and I, I think that's what, I mean, I, it, it was a shift, because that's not how I thought as a high school kid, and I'm not going to, I'm going to raise my kid a little differently, because um, I would have done anything to be a professional athlete, anything, really, because that's, there's the idolatry. Yeah. Um, but inculcating a, a whole different mindset um, in terms of how are, do you want them to know and love the Lord and help others do the same. It, if they're not, if that's not happening for their kid, like, well, you should drop everything to figure out how to make that happen. If, if that's what would help. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. I think that goes back to what William Farley, you know, said. And it's hard every time I say that. I think Chris Farley is it? <laughs> he laughs it. Yeah, Greg was there. Um, of just you know the the assumption of. Parents, they just assume their child's salvation. They, they assume they're okay. Um, and so that's why they can justify all the time out on the field and absent from church because they're good. They prayed a prayer. They went through a communicants class. They walked out, whatever. Um, so they're, they're good. Um, but, yeah, constantly getting them to, to look at their student's heart. And, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, why do you hate sports so much? Kurt said he hated them. That wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> I told John before he talked, I said, uh, I always tell all my parents, hey, isn't it going to be great when your daughter gets to college? I can't guarantee she'll use that volleyball serve, but she will definitely question your faith. So go ahead. <laughs> so, so, five hours at volleyball is really going to help her with that philosophy professor when she's like, do I believe in any of this? So just get Kurt to come to your church and he'll talk to your parents. Um, so look, I was, I did do a talk one time on film and theology, and people would see me. And they're like, "Hey, the movie guy. I don't want to be that. Hey, the guy who hates sports." Or the anti-sports. So I'm, I'm not anti-sports. I'm not against it. Um, let me go ahead and close this out in prayer, and then do we want to do just a brief break, and then you'll get up? Okay. All right. Heavenly Father, um, we ask for your wisdom. Uh, as we've discussed, Lord, there's so many questions, there's so many difficulties, uh, Lord. There, we don't want to come across as as legalistic or graceless um, to to families, to students, Lord. But we know that you do call us to have difficult conversations, to challenge students, um, Lord, in their idolatry. Um, so I ask for for wisdom for each of these uh, people here, as well as myself, Lord, in our various church contexts of how to. Uh, to challenge, to push back on some of the worldview uh, associated with sports. Um, Lord, help us to, to appreciate sports in their proper context, Lord, but not to, to worship them as a God. That's in your name I pray. Amen. Yeah, no problem.